Yeah. Yeah. No problem, sir. Uh, we're uh, quite uh, fortunate to have with us today two individuals that I, if I'm not mistaken, have a pretty interesting story to tell. Uh, Jamie Coots, Fire Chief of Slave Lake, Alberta, and Mark Missile, Town Councillor of Slave Lake, Alberta. Uh, interesting thing is Mark is also an independent air attack uh, coordinator. So I'm going to turn over the floor to Jamie and Mark. And thanks again for coming. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come to uh, speak today. Uh, as he said, I'm an elected official. Uh, sorry about that. I'm an air attack coordinator, which means I supervise all air attack, including fixed wings and helicopters on fire suppression and initial attack. I'm also a homeowner, and for the last nine months, I've been living in my daughter's basement. And uh, I think what we're going to do is well, I'll cover a little bit on fire weather, fire action. Uh, we'll talk about the post-fire and then finally recovery. But uh, here's Jamie. So yeah, like you said, I'm the fire chief. So we actually run a regional fire service. Uh, there's four communities uh, that have fire halls of uh, just under 100 firefighters and uh, about a dozen pieces of equipment at that time that uh, are under my control. I'm just going to start with a little video here. Possibly. Uh, nope, doesn't appear to be showing up. Okay, a little bit of a technical glitch. Well, we'll see if we can get that at this uh, video later. Uh, alt. Escape. Back into this. Okay. Good on the screen? Okay. Anyway, Slave Lake fires May 14th and 15th, 2011. Early spring. Uh, ground is still frozen. We don't have green up yet. And I'm just going to go through a few of the situations that uh, set up for this fire. Yeah. Okay. Back up. We need, we need back up. I'll just go to this. Yeah, slides are progressive. The fire hall, we started using a hammer right now, so. Is this powerful? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, November 2011, RCMP's initial investigation concluded, concluded the cause of the wildfire was arson. Uh, when this statement was released, you can imagine the impact on citizens in the town and across Alberta. Uh, that investigation is ongoing. It's being conducted at such a high level, local RCMP don't even know about it. Uh, a lot of people are being interviewed. Because of all the ongoing investigations, I hope you're sensitive to a lot of questions I may not be able to answer because of confidentiality issues. Jamie, on the other hand, will tell you everything in the world. Okay, we were talking about, is this a one-off event? This is a 50-year map of wildfires around Slave Lake. Uh, one-off, not likely. This town has been threatened by fire uh, significantly in those 50 years. And in fact, most of this has been in the last 30 years. There are wind events, and that seems to be what's driving them. Now, besides the, uh, the bright red, there are current fires of 2011. What's not shown on here are other fires to the south, to the north, that also uh, were causing evacuations. Two years before this, I was involved in the initial attack on a fire with a wind event coming from the west. Uh, that fire was relatively small, but it did run right through a community with a loss of some structures. The wind in that circumstance was reported at 125 kilometers an hour. The lake was still frozen, so it really limited some of the action we could take. For the fire bugs in the crowd, uh, this was lookout data uh, from surrounding towers. The major things I want you to pay attention to are wind gusts. In fact, Deer Mountain, at one point, had reported a gust of well over 120 kilometers an hour. So again, major wind event. 
Um, ISIs, which initial spread index, uh, it's no surprise that uh, we had numbers like that. Basically, they're referring to uh, spread per minute. So we talked about fine fuels. These are the things that a fire is going to ignite in and travel in, uh, all extreme. Here is your medium fuels, your fuel loading, and you can see it's relatively green. Uh, we had a huge snow load during that winter. In fact, I wore out two shovels. We, were, we had snow loads of eight feet in the surrounding hills. Because of the wind, event, those evaporated instantly. But everything is fairly wet on the ground, in the ground. When the wind stopped, the fire stopped. Rate of spread, incredible rate of spreads throughout the entire Slave Lake area. And this is kind of the uh, fire protection management area for there. Fire intensity, we've seen this one already. Because of those spread rates, we knew we had very intense fires. And we were talking about ranks of fires, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Air tankers become challenged on rank four. Rank five, it's pretty iffy. Rank six, give it up. Uh, Slave Lake fires were rank six. So, a couple of slides people may not have seen. On my initial attack, this is what I saw five minutes back arriving on the fire. So we had ignition. The wind is pushing that column down. It's already starting to turn dark gray and black. 15 minutes later, it's up and rolling. You can see the community and residences right in front of it. And this was a kilometer and a half away. 33 minutes, it was into the community. And structures were burning. In terms of advance warning, you can't do much in 33 minutes. Evacuations were uh, called for. Uh, road closures were called for. RCMP, fire departments, everything was called for. But 33 minutes, not a lot of time. OK, I'll just skip past that. Sunday evening, this is what I saw when I took off. One third of the town burning. Um, Horrendous experience. You can see how this fire came into the town. Now this is, uh, at the bottom is the east side of town. This fire is traveling east to west. Relatively very little fire across this major highway. However, it started spotting. The wind was carrying firebrands. And in fact, the firebrands, uh, probably on some of the most intense fires we've had in Alberta, we are counting firebrands of 30 to 40 per square meter of chunks of fire landing. Now, we found a piece of canvas they did a study on. It was a, basically a six by six canvas. They calculated a fire brand of over 900 hits per, per square meter. So we knew this fire was, was traveling and hopping. Okay, Slave Lake was not the only fire going. Slave Lake is the fire down at the bottom. We had a huge fire further up that we had to deal with. That fire went into a community of Canyon Creek, and Wagner was responsible for burning a lot of structures and homes down in there. If you look on the other side, you can see the faint outlines of a third fire over there. What you're not seeing is two other fires to the south and two huge fires to the north that were tying up resources. We went at it in terms of air tanker action. We had 24 fixed wings in the air. Uh, Alberta probably has one of the mo most diverse and largest air tanker fleet in Canada. We had pulled every resource off every single fire due to the priority of Slave Lake. And uh, we couldn't catch it. What you're seeing here is a retardant drop from a uh, uh, it's called an Electra, four big four engine, 25 gallon, 100 gallon retardant tank. And uh, this is when the winds had died right down. We're just strictly reinforcing the road. Tactics are run the flanks and then try and get across the head. However, with the spoke, we couldn't see targets in there, so it became a very difficult, uh, very risky maneuver. Okay. Okay. 
So the evacuation, uh, we've heard a little bit about that from, from different perspectives. Um, certainly 33 minutes, you saw the picture. So um, as people were starting to leave those areas, uh, I was, I guess, with the group of guys that went back in. So hundreds of people trying to get out and a few dozen of us are trying to get back in. Uh, the lineups, once they got out of the danger zone, once they got out of the southeast portion of the town, um, became fairly, the lineups were friendly. People were stopping and letting each other in. They were stopping and letting people back out. They were stuff you probably wouldn't even normally see on a normal day. Um, you know, they were they were trying to get along, trying to move through, uh, trying to move thousands of people through. And you have to remember that these the evacuation of Slave Lake was after we'd already evacuated uh, four different communities into Slave Lake. So we'd taken all the rural areas and sent them into the the urban center, and now we were trying to take the urban center and send them out. So it was, uh, you know, our, our evacuation zone was over 40 kilometers long, uh, all along one highway. And uh, during the evacuation, at the start of it especially, um, the smoke and the soot and everything in these areas was uh, extreme. And all, so our community is led uh, out. You can go out three different directions, one highway going north, one east, one west. And uh, those three fires that you saw previously had all of those highways shut down. There was no, no access in or out. Um, as a matter of fact, some of the firefighters that came from other towns to get us had to fight their way through the fire to get to help us. Um, I should talk a little bit about the evacuation process inside the danger zone. I was talking about how nice it was outside. Um, inside, it would be just like you would expect. It, it was the... Uh, I wouldn't say people are giving each other the finger and stuff, but they, they was, uh, you know, there was a lot of chaos there and everybody was uh, you know, in it to get out for themselves. Um, I watched a sunfire hit one of our four inch hoses that still had water in it, and it went about a foot in the air. And then he went up on a guy's lawn, threw his fence back onto the street and, and kept going. Uh, a lot of people would just come out of the smoke at us and stop and say, like, are we evacuating? I was like, I, I would if I could, <laughs> it's up to you. So, you know, there was a lot of, there were some anger issues, I guess you could say, inside the evacuation zone. Uh, spot fires, so the, the map that, uh, or sorry, the picture that Mark had shown earlier, um, it, what it was was just hundreds, maybe thousands of little spot fires all over the place. And everywhere you walked, um, we were on 12th Street, which is the farthest street to the east uh, with the crew that I was working with. And, and everywhere you looked and everywhere you walked, there was a small fire starting. You know, if I had a couple thousand firefighters with uh, Wajax backpacks full of water on their back, we might have been able to get to all the places at the same time. Uh, we were dealing at that time, there was about uh, seven trucks, probably, and about four contract trucks and 63 firefighters at that time. And that's all firefighters on the Sunday that had been up now for 36 hours straight with no, we didn't get a break. The night before, Mitsu burnt down and it doesn't get, I guess, all the hype that Slave Lake does, but. Um, there was a whole bunch of structures that burnt down to the uh, east of Slave Lake the night before, and we spent all night working on that. So to run around and try and get this out, I mean, at the same time, all these spot fires, there's no power because it's a three-feed community for power also. It just happens to be north, east, and west. So all of those power uh, lines are down, so we're, we're out of power, which means we're out of water in our town. Um, and then, uh, of course, when the structures start to burn down, every structure has a half-inch water line feeding it, but 400 half-inch water lines is a lot of water. I'm just a fireman. I'm not good with math, but I know that uh, it's a lot of water. And So we're out of water. We're out of power, which means we're out of communication. And uh, I wouldn't say we're out of hope at this time, but we're, we're fighting to stay in it. So it's, uh, this is Mark's neighborhood. And uh, basically right in the middle of the, the hardest hit, most damaged area is a big park. And uh, I don't know if Mark's place is on fire in this one, but yeah, <laughs> but uh, basically that, that neighborhood is decimated. There's nothing left standing. And uh, across the street, be to the left of that, uh, it also got a church and six three-story apartment buildings. So all of these areas, uh, you know, it's probably a two kilometer, three kilometer stretch and all these areas are on fire, one right after the other. Um, houses, I was watching full houses burn to the ground in 30 minutes. And there was a time on 12th Street when I was standing there, 
that I counted to 30 and then just quit. I couldn't take it anymore. So 30, 30 houses on fire right where I'm standing. Uh, and you have to remember, this is not the city of Toronto. This is the town of Slave Lake, 7,000 people. Lived there for 30 years. Not one of those houses that's on fire I haven't been in at some time to visit somebody. All right, so it's, it's, uh, it's a personal deal for the people that are there that are trying to, to do this stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking bodies, friends, neighbors, family. Um, Mark lost his house. Uh, my niece's house was the third one to catch on fire, and I didn't know if she was gone or there. My sister-in-law lost her place in about five minutes after this picture was taken across the street from Mark's. Um, you know, in, in all this, we, we lost a lot as a town. Uh, lost a lot as a fire department. We lost a truck on the first day on the Saturday. We lost a fire hall on the Sunday out in one of the rural areas. So um, when you talk about loss and, and the personal stakes and all this, which is, I guess, why I'm here, giving you the boots on the ground type of uh, ideas, um, I work with uh, those volunteer firefighters, and those guys didn't know where their families were. We actually had to take a five-minute TV time out and uh, everybody left the line, and that just gave them five minutes to find their families and tell them where to go and what to do. Um, our communications were mostly down. You could text a little bit. Cell phones were basically useless except for texting, so uh, we gave them five minutes for everybody to track their families. If they couldn't find their families, they had to uh, leave the line. Because you can't, you can't fight if you don't know what your family's doing. Uh, so this is the, the rest of that block. Um, burning and you can see it wasn't one house at a time it was dozens hundreds of houses at a time um, this is all going on you know we're still four streets this way moving back trying to get to the edge of it uh, th this one is interesting and, and really brings to mind what it was like on the ground so I just gonna ask you to do me a favor just close your eyes for a minute everybody just close your eyes for a minute Right? Think about the hottest you've ever been. You're on a beach in Hawaii, or you're, you're in a hot shower, you're in a hot tub cooking. Right? Where we are, it's 10 times hotter than that. And somebody's using a sandblaster, trying to blast our skin off. You can't see, you can't breathe, you can't even get a breath to cough. And then these campers, just pop, 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 pop. Right? And then that, those pops turn into just a never-ending string. It's the first time in my life I felt like I, I know probably what it's like to be in a gun battle with automatic weapons. There was so many going off. After about the first four or five minutes, I didn't even duck anymore. I didn't even care. And then the big settling and oxygen bottles would start to go off. Then we got a, a call somehow through our uh, radio about a 100-pound keg of black powder. Some guy likes to shoot cannons in his spare time. So they call us up and say, there's a 100 pound keg of black powder in this basement. I don't, I don't have a clue what that means. <laughs> we didn't even go look for it. We just kept <laughs> doing what we're doing. But uh, those are the kinds of things where, you know, you just don't know what to think or what to do or where to go or where to run. And it's raining down on you. Uh, this is a tough one, I think. For both of us as well, this is our government center uh, that, that was lost fairly early in this fire. Uh, it was also our EOC, our emergency operations center. So they left the emergency operations center with uh, bottles of water in their hand trying to, to get away. We had crews working on this fire and at the hospital uh, at the same time. And uh, probably one of, the, one of the more rugged decisions that had to be made was to try and save this or to try and save the hospital with the limited manpower and resources that we had. We could only pick one. So uh, this one lost. But uh, we did save the hospital. It's, that's still there. Um, but every day, I, I wish I could have saved both. Uh, you know, this is where my paychecks used to come from. Uh, this is where all our paperwork was, all the offices uh, for the provincial government and for the, the town of Slave Lake. Um, where you can see the bulk of the fire, that's our regional library. That building was about a year old, give yeah, or take. Old. Yeah, we were still working on deficiencies. Uh, so 
night day and night was a funny one because uh, I see a lot of pictures just like you got to see a lot of pictures of blue sky it's all blue with this big black cloud uh, for me and the folks that I work with we went in there about 3 30 to that black cloud and we never saw daylight again till the next morning at uh, about eight o'clock there was no blue sky where I worked there was no uh, sun there was I actually thought it turned to night at 3 30 and didn't know the difference till eight o'clock in the morning uh, and, and night was just this, you know, it was more of fires. Um, finally got back to the fire hall and of course got some maps out and drew some defensive perimeters and uh, spent the night trying to organize a, a fight of that defensive perimeter. This, uh, this house, we walked up to the corner myself and one of the firefighters, it was just one house on fire down by those spruce trees at first and I, I said to him, I said, Ronnie, geez, look at this. There's another house starting on fire halfway down the street. And he says, don't worry about that one. And uh, it didn't even seem weird at the time. And <laughs> we started walking back to the truck. And I said, geez, Ronnie, why, why don't I have to worry about that one? And he said, that's, that's my rental place. Don't worry about it. Those guys are already out. I already know. So that, you know, the mentality of the firefighters was just, this is, this is happening. We're going to do the best we can. But um, during this fire... Uh, seven of our firefighters lost their homes almost immediately in those neighborhoods. They knew they were burnt while we were standing there on 12th Street. Uh, and then more firefighters lost theirs later in the night out by our fire hall in Canyon Creek, Whitewater. Okay, uh, just quickly, fire closed all three highways in the town. Because of the outgoing uh, group of people, we are evacuating 14,000 people. Uh, we had to create temporary staging areas within town. We chose Walmart, a Ball Diamond, and the airport. A lot of people did not have enough fuel in their vehicles to leave town. So they were forced into going to one of these evac centers. With the roads closed, uh, same issue was going on. With the power out, the gas stations could not pump fuel. Uh, with the cell towers down and, and electrical out, we had no cell coverage within town. So uh, we staged a lot of people in these centers. You can imagine how uh, stressed they were. At the airport, we sat there just watching propane tanks sail through the sky. The evacuation of seniors, hospital uh, patients, and those without transportation had precedent. Uh, there is a lot of people in town that would not leave until all the seniors were out. In the case of the airport, we had ambulances arriving with patients because they couldn't get out and they needed some place to put them because they feared the hospital was going to burn. We started putting patients on beds at the airport, wherever we could find space. We also then got into the problem of shelter for displaced people. And that was going to evac centers. Uh, as soon as the roads were open and we were getting conflicting messages from RCMP, it's open, now it's closed, then it's open again, go west, no, that's closed, go east. Uh, people eventually got to evac centers. Um, that was Westlock, uh, Edmonton, Grand Prairie, High Prairie. Uh, if these names don't sound familiar, that's okay. Athabasca, we had over 1,200 people in that evac center. Um, we had such an outpouring of help from across Alberta. It was, it was just amazing to put up with uh, all of us in, in such a stressed environment. Okay, Jamie can talk to you about uh, four zones that were established. So the, the burned area uh, right off the bat caused some uh, concern, I guess. Uh, people were evacuated. We were inside. Of course, took time to have that perimeter. Um, we had 38 fire departments come and over 750 firefighters over about three days um, come to assist us. So as we started to get the, uh, the damage under control and hold the line, um, we, we certainly uh, had to take our time and make sure that the damaged homes were the damaged ones on the map and the undamaged ones were the undamaged ones. Uh, there was a point where somebody on Facebook released a map that wasn't finished, which caused a lot of grief because there was 14 burnt homes that weren't burned on that Facebook map. So, um, you know, we had to make sure that we, we did the right thing and that the right things were marked on the map uh, correctly. So I know that caused some concern as to how long that took, but you can imagine seeing a, 
your house red on a map and then finding out that it was actually green. So um, some of that took time. The, the areas of the town were uh, immediately put into four staging groups uh, and those groups were going to be, you know, how we could resettle back into those areas. Um, the, the plan originally was five weeks to get back into town, to get people back into town. And uh, due to the hard work and planning of a lot of people, we crunched that down to uh, two weeks. Uh, I know that sounds like a lot if you're displaced from your home, but uh, when you're standing in the middle of the wreckage, two weeks sounds pretty fast. Uh, we watched people do things that just can't be done, but uh, they did them anyways. Um, I watched three days of fencing, security and uh, safety fencing go up. It was supposed to take three days of 150 firefighters. It took one night of 100 firefighters. So, um, the, you know, these areas, it, yeah, it took time, but uh, you can imagine with over 30% of your town burned down that uh, those types of things take time. Uh, just a quick comment on this. Uh, we divided the town into four zones. Then we had to go through each zone assessing infrastructure damage before we could allow people in for any rebuilds. That took a fairly long time. Uh, zone one was almost uh, okay, because the fire flashed through there so quick, but where it penetrated, burned for a long period of time, we did have utility damage, we did have water sewage damage. Uh, some of it caused by the fire, some of it by heavy equipment in there working. Consequences of the fire, and I'll show you a couple of pictures later on, but our landfill. With the power out for two weeks, you can imagine the houses that didn't burn the condition of those uh, uh, refrigerators and freezers. Uh, they all had to be replaced. We had to set up temporary housing, and temporary housing for about uh, 780 in individuals um, was a major uh, effort. Uh, Slave Lake is built on a swamp, kind of, so we had to bring in soil and put about three to four feet of uh, gravel on top of areas that we were putting these temporary housings in. At one point, we were having gravel trucks arriving from 50 kilometers away, arriving every minute and a half. It was a massive effort, and it happened very quick. Uh, so we had a bunch of infrastructure damage to the town. That is still an ongoing assessment. Uh, we are still scoping out lines to figure out exactly uh, how things are. We've had a couple uh, explosions during the construction period when propane leaked into sewage lines and then was ignited, causing uh, a couple ruptured lines and in one case shrapnel flying up inside of a rebuilt home. Another problem was our tax roll. We have lost one third of probably the most valuable homes in Slave Lake. Our tax roll was destroyed. We have an issue with volunteer uh, firefighter recruitment. As Jamie said, uh, a lot of these guys are in their first year with not a lot of experience. And this is, if I was correct, Jamie, an ongoing issue, especially when you burn them out in the first week. We have ongoing social problems, and I'll speak to that in a little bit. We've lost a lot of our professional staff, teachers, uh, teachers, uh, doctors, uh, other, other people, a lot of town, town staff too. And we're going through a lot of uh, reconstruction efforts, uh, focused on structures, focused on getting people back into their homes. And we had a lot of vegetation lost. Uh, wildfire tends to do that. We lost our regional library, we lost our government center. We lost a lot of RCMP members. In fact, uh, we prob I think we lost seven RCMP members out of the 13 in the detachment. No place to live. In one case, one of the RCMP, uh, his whole head had little char marks on it from standing there doing the evac, uh, flagging traffic, getting them out of town, even while embers were landing on his head. We've lost 20 teachers, and that has had a major impact right now on the uh, schools in town. A lot of schools are under a lot of stress. We've lost five doctors. Again, out of 12 doctors, we've lost five. Of the doctors, eight lost their homes. We've lost municipal workers. We've lost families that have left the community and are not returning. 
The overall goal right from the get-go was to return Slave Lake to the same condition with the same population as before. This was a commitment from the Alberta government and uh, the effort's been astounding. They estimated the time frame for this is five years. The estimated infrastructure redevelopment is seven years. We figure five years to get everybody under a, under a roof and get it up to the same uh, population size as before. But of course, then we have infrastructure. Even once the rebuild has gone on, we have to go reassess every single road, sidewalk, uh, crossing, you name it, in town. A lot of that will need replacement way over our capital plan. This is our landfill. This is what 7,000 homes and refrigerators look like. Our landfill was designed for a five-year model. We're down to one year now because of this sort of stuff coming in. The landfill guys were absolutely amazing to handle this type of volume and traffic. They set up scales, they brought extra equipment in, they perfected ways of taking the gas out of these uh, refrigerators and recycling and, and they tried as best as they could to recycle all metal here. Um, I just see a sore back when I look at that picture. But uh, the, uh, along at the landfill, they also had a um, three-quarter ton pickup truck filled right to the top, right to the cab. Six truckloads like that of propane bottles. All right, we had these acetylene and oxygen bottles. We had, so the dangerous goods was uh, phenomenal as well. And of course, our landfill is not really set up for handling dangerous goods. So we, we brought in professionals for that. Um, but uh, the, the handling of all of the, the waste that's generated during something like this was, uh, was phenomenal. Actually filled up the cell, they had to dig a, a new cell. So filled up a 20 year cell. Reports from the landfill were, it, the stench was so bad the ravens wouldn't even come in. But just one thing talking about smell, uh, Slave Lake was so toxic, we did not get birds or insects showing up for a month. That's how, how bad it was in town. This is temporary housing. Now our initial surveys indicated we need 300 homes. Uh, you can see the pads they're sitting on. They are all full serviced. Uh, that took a lot of time to put in and that was the town's main focus was getting people back into the communities with a roof over their head. Uh, these were purchased by the Alberta government and right now we are going through an exit strategy. As people move into homes, what do we do with these trailers? They still belong to the Alberta government. I don't know if they're up for sale or being moved out. Okay, getting a bit into recovery. We have massive social issues going on. Family violence crimes up 400%. Youth server worker inter intervention 200%. We have, according to the RCMP and social service agencies and the hospitals, increased alcoholism health issues. We have a lot of people, including myself, going through post-traumatic stress disorder. For our sociologists and, and medical people, we've been told that suicides will begin to show up a year to two years after the event. And it's because of frustrations, personal issues, and ongoing. We lost two churches. We have 720 families displaced, homeless. As my wife kept telling me, I, I keep giving the charities, and my wife said, stop that, you're homeless. And it, it just never dawned on me. And again, evacuating that many people in that short a time was a major effort. Okay, financial costs, and this is really the amount of money that was flowing into slave, or flowing into Slave Lake. It's not actual expenditures. Insurance Bureau estimated 700 million. Funding from the Alberta government, 289 million. Uh, donations from the Rotary. Uh, I'm saying 1.5 million, it's up a lot higher than that now through fundraising and rotary clubs right across Canada and the United States. Donations put into the Red Cross coming from all over the place. We've had donations uh, from uh, Singapore. Some gentleman there decided you guys need a couple thousand bucks. We've had uh, uh, musicians do concerts in town and, and one handing over, Paul Brandt, handing over $127,000 to the library. We've had a uh, 12-year-old girl up in Yellowknife running a uh, lemonade stand that donated all her money to Slave Lake. It was like $130. This type of thing just went on over and over and over. 
again, and it, it's still happening. In terms of uh, physical donation of clothes and stuff like that, I, I can't remember how many 18-wheelers uh, that we had. It was way more than we could process, and we started using one of the forestry uh, mills to start storing, uh, selecting, going through the stuff, and then trying to distribute. At the end of the day, it was 30 or 40 uh, tractor trailers we could not process and had to turn around someplace. We still knew that certain communities still had, like, 10 units still sitting there. Uh, private donations, this is coming in from the oil patch, this is coming in from all over the place. We're estimating at 12 million, I've just heard uh, another $10 million donation coming from a, another organization. So overall, we expect expenditures and uh, being spent in Slave Lake to be over a billion dollars. Restructured zoning, I talked about this uh, before. Uh, key point is, to date, we've given out 170 building permits. 74 houses are now under construction. Myself, I probably was one of the first 10 uh, to move in. My construction on my house did not begin until September 1. Uh, my first check from the insurance companies arrived in October, November. I had the finance to rebuild myself until that happened. I, uh, as I said, I lived in my uh, daughter's house in the basement with her boyfriend and her up above, and it was at the least awkward. Uh, after nine months, we moved into our house about two weeks ago. We have housing challenges. As I said, uh, originally we were estimating 370, then it was down to 300, then it was down to 250, um, then it was down to 200. These people found alternate accommodation with family, with friends, in the basements of their children, um, out of town. I mean, a lot left. There's, there's no way I can go against that. Uh, we established four different development areas for these temporary trailers. One we call Phoenix uh, 140, Fournier 78. You can see we started wiping out bush, wiping out ball diamonds, wiping out recreational facilities in town. And uh, these are still things we have to go through in a recru recovery to replace. Structural losses. This is town only. I'm not talking about uh, what happened outside of town. 280, 289 structures. Two churches, one bar, six apartment buildings, one library, government center, and five businesses. You can choose the priority what was most important. Some people are crying over the bar. Some people are crying over the churches. Nobody's really crying over the government center. I don't know why. <laughs> Reconstruction um, of the 389, 309 houses have been through their demolition. Six lots have been abandoned. We cannot even locate the owners. Uh, 74 houses are now under construction, and as I said, 170 burn, uh, building permits have been handed out. I'll let Jimmy talk about these. The, uh, it's still in that neighborhood on the bottom right, um, when you go in there, I don't, I don't know if we remember if we brought any pictures of some of the reconstruction that started there, but um, you're, you're looking at the third of a town burnt to the ground, right? Uh, this, is, this is a few days after. Uh, we lost the last house on Tuesday afternoon. So it came into town Sunday. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think that it just came into town and burned a bunch of stuff down and then quit. Um, we had fire departments there helping us for over two weeks, uh, still trying to control what was there. And again, the town was just part of it. It was a 40 kilometer long stretch. Um, that uh, we lost houses to the east and to the west. Uh, it burnt around the town to the north into the provincial park. So it, it was a widespread. Um, our area of responsibility is 10,490 square kilometers. And uh, probably about 800 square kilometers of it had some kind of fire damage. So it, it's a big area, uh, a long uh, area with uh, lots of different fires going in it. And to go into that, when it was on fire was one thing. To go back in when it wasn't on fire was quite another. Uh, it's still, uh, I start every day dropping my kids off at school, which would be just to the right of that picture. 
and then driving through the zone to see how the construction workers are making out and see if we got any new starts or any of that stuff. So um, it, it's tough to tough to look at some of the areas that are tough for me. I'll just point out uh, right there was my niece's house. Right there was my sister-in-law's house. That's Mark's place. So. Um, you know, to go back into those areas all day, everybody kind of talked about the psychological effects, and uh, um, I, I put it this simply: just that's how firemen are. We're all broken, and I don't know if you get fixed from something like this. So you, you know, a piece of your your brain is broken, or your heart, or wherever you want to say it's from. But uh, I, I don't know if you ever fully recover from that. For us, you know, the dawn of a new fire season is just days away in our province. Uh, they started early and, uh, you know, things have changed, but it's still right there. Um, you know, we hear the one of. I'll tell you what, I don't buy that for a second. Um, do I think our town's going to burn down again? I sure hope not. And uh, stake a lot of what I do and what I am on that, but uh, there's going to be others. We got we to gotta pay attention here. Okay, I'll, I'll go through these next slides pretty quick. This is what a basement looks like burned. You can see uh, just about everything incinerated. And there's people with fire boxes. Uh, they left the fire boxes, all their personal stuff inside. Fire boxes aren't designed for this intense burn. They're usually designed for 15 minutes. Most of the fire boxes were okay, but everything inside was incinerated. That includes insurance policies. Uh, this is my house. Not much left. Um, how it ignited, I don't know, you saw a few pictures of that street, how fire progressed around the street. We talked about wicks. Fire finds a way of traveling, whether that's a wood fence, a tree, whichever way it's going to move. Houses, after all, are now, to us wildfire guys, just a new fuel type. Site demolition, once we had the basements cleaned out, and uh, that was quite an effort, and I believe in the... This was one of the first actions that a consortium of insurance companies got together and said, hey, if we get together, uh, this will be much more efficient and uh, we'll save some dollars on this to get her done quicker. I don't know of any other cases in Canada where that's happened. We had site abandonment issues going on. Uh, again, people just left. I don't know for what reason. Um, whether they're renters, homeowners, I have no idea. Reconstruction, these are my neighbors and they are gloriously happy. Uh, I can say my house was further along than theirs, so I was more happy. Uh, reconstruction on houses uh, began. Um, the street I live in, the little area is called Parkdale, is probably one of the most uh, most forward right now in, in terms of reconstruction. We had the deal with this, burn vehicles, hundreds abandoned throughout town. Uh, there was issues of accessing private property to remove these. We got to a point where we finally uh, uh, issued a letter to everybody that we could find and all the homeowners affected saying that free of charge, we'll tow these out and get rid of them. There's still a lot in there. Uh, we brought in uh, cranes here with uh, uh, magnets on them. They started picking up all this metal, dropping them into compressors, and you can see right now they're, they're in blocks, whatever type of metal it used to be. Other houses, you can see an example of the fences there, and the fences went up both for security and safety reasons. Security and that uh, we didn't want people wandering around, safety issues, we didn't want kids or anybody from the rest of town wandering onto a job site. Before and after, my house again. Basement, uh, before it's dug out, and uh, I walked into that ash pit, was up to my uh, waist. And my rebuilt. So there were houses in town, and this one, the entire street was absolutely leveled. This house survived. Uh, melted a little bit of siding, but who cares? We now have issues in town where 
uh, one house survived on a street or two houses burned on a street and the people around saying, how come they get brand new houses? It, it's just part of survivor psychology. Uh, you'll see in the front window of this, these signs, and we created these signs uh, as a way of letting the utility companies know who needed gas, who needed power, who needed uh, water hooked up. Uh, once it was hooked up, they started pulling off the signs, and it was a quick visual for these utility companies to work through. We got into fire smart initiatives. One was ha hazard identification throughout the entire region, not just in Slave Lake, but uh, as Jamie was alluding to, uh, it's a massive region. We looked at vegetative management, uh, which means either reducing the amount of fuels out there or changing fuels to a non-volatile species. We looked at additional fire suppression equipment, and I think Jamie can talk about all the resources that have come in to help him. We looked at additional egress routes both in and out, and we're still getting comments from citizens. Uh, because of the evacuations and the line of vehicles, they felt that if they're behind more than two vehicles, it was not acceptable. I can tell you during the evacuation, not a single person was hurt. It was very orderly. Um, down the highways, everybody sticking to that 50 kilometers an hour, nobody passing. Uh, I mean, you could have planned that better. We've hired our own fire smart, cross trained in both structural and uh, wildfire. They're doing a lot of fire smart uh, work for us right now. In terms of fire smart initiatives, I never mentioned uh, a price tag. Out of that 289 million the Alberta gave us, 20 million is dedicated to fire smart in the Slave Lake area with the goal of creating uh, Slave Lake as a fire smart model for the rest of Alberta, if not Canada. We got into huge public edu education programs around fire smart, a lot of community meetings, a lot of radio, um, you name it, signage, uh, right across the whole communities and outside. We've created uh, our a creation of a fire smart in an EOZ training center, which is one of our visions. Uh, not only to train people in fire smart, how to do assessments, but also to set up an EOC, which is uh, uh, emergency uh, what's the operations center. Start training people how to deal with that. And as a training center, in the case of another emergency, we can use it for both. We also looked at backup generators because of power issues during the event. So, some fire smart issues. Here we got asphalt siding going on, uh, or asphalt shingles. Fairly fireproof, not 100% like a tin roof, but uh, not too bad. You'll notice on the side of this house is a product called Fire Boss. Um, not a bad type of siding. Uh, now these initiatives were put in because of new building code regulations that required some sort of fireproofing siding or insulation in between structures. Somebody heard about the pink houses showing up all over Slave Lake. Now building code said it was you just needed uh, fireproof siding between structures. Uh, this gentleman went full bore. And uh, there's quite a few homes like this uh, around town. This one is a cement board. Again, my place. I mean, I've seen enough fire. I wanted the, the most fire protection I could. So I've actually got fire boss, boss underneath that cement siding over top. And uh, unknowns to me, the uh, cement board uh, provides a level of soundproofing. And uh, it actually raises the R factor in a, in a house. So I've been just overjoyed with this product. So challenges, accommodation for workers. Initially we were told if we were going to have a rebuild of 300 and whatever structures, we needed 800 workers to do this in a year. Not feasible, we do not have the capacity for that many workers, housing for them, food, anything for them. We looked at 400 workers. We were told 400 workers and tradespeople, two years. Still impossible for us. We still have industry around town, workers around town that need accommodation and we can't hold back. So we're trying to balance out accommodation. Again, with temporary trailers, we're considering being able to move our tradespeople into this temporary trailers as they're coming available. 
Um, however, there's people with higher priorities that we need to find accommodation for. Infrastructure or tax roll long-term costs, the Alberta government has picked up the cost of that. Uh, as a person moves into their, their home and water is turned on, they begin paying taxes. Right now we're going through a process of house appraisals because we know the uh, assessment value will be much higher than before, which means people will be paying higher taxes than before. And that's a bone of contention. As an elected official, you get earfuls on that one. Uh, infrastructure, again, utilities, roads, sidewalks, all of it needs replacement or at least uh, some sort of scoping out for evaluation. Social services, we're bringing in extra people if we can find accommodation for them to help with the kids, help with families, help with seniors. Just about everybody I know who lost a place is going through some form of stress. Um, this will be a long, ongoing process. We've been improving public communications. We're working with the uh, emergency management system people in Alberta, setting up not only uh, apps for smartphones, but uh, um, signage, looking at uh, siren systems, um, tying into Facebook and tying into the internet. Uh, social media was so far beyond what we could do. There was more pictures of fire during the evacuation paid, or posted on uh, YouTube than we could keep up. And as we know about social media, uh, eventually social media became a uh, fact. Uh, whether it was right or wrong, we still had to deal with it. Then we had to deal with uh, high intensity residential fire building code or HERF. Herf stated in the new building construction that uh, there was a setback between houses. No windows could be long between houses. You needed fireproof siding. I think there was one other condition I can't remember. It, doors. Doors, okay, uh, improvement of fireproof doors. In order to meet this requirement, a person that had a 1,200 square foot home could not put that footprint on the same lot. They were forced into two-story homes. That was the only way they could recover that footprint. And uh, again, additional building costs because of that sort of thing. Uh, also, once you cannot put windows on the sides of your buildings or houses, you're restricted from where you put bedrooms. Because bedrooms, uh, by code, have to have windows out. So only windows could go out the back or front of houses. Positives. Jamie can talk about a lot of these too, but any uh, recreational facilities we lost or, or had to convert during the fire, uh, we are replacing them. So we'll get uh, brand new ball diamond soccer fields, wherever we had to put uh, temporary houses on. We are establishing an evac center now because we know that how all the other communities helped us out, it's going to be our turn eventually to help them. We will have an improved infrastructure, roads, water, utilities. However, all of these have a certain lifespan. All of their lifespans are going to end at the same time. Do we have the capital plan to deal with this? No. All our funding um, we look at has to have longevity to it. We can't just have funding for a three-year project. We need long-term maintenance of whatever we start. In some cases, we are given things and Jamie can say a, a new fire truck, but how do we maintain that? We do not have the resources to maintain that fire truck 10 years from now. We have established a Fire Smart Regional Action Team, FRAT, which is really a, a team uh, looking after all fire smart operations, developing options, um, budgets, and bringing them back to council. Now, in terms of council, we are probably one of the first in Canada to form a tri-council, which is the town, the MD, and First Nations. All decisions go back to tri-council. Even though they're not a legal entity, tri-council does approvals for all expenditures based on recommendations from these groups. And we are working on a consensus model. You think 17 people in a room can come to consensus? Nay. Uh, we're looking at road intersection redevelopment to, uh, to improve some of the uh, highways around us. And there's two major intersections that really need it. We had to put in temporary road crossings, temporary lighting in some areas. We were 
developing whole new communities people had to live in and they needed access to town and to the schools. And we're going through so many investigations right now of trying to identify best practices. I always like to conclude by thanking Sustainable Resource Development, our forestry group, air attack uh, officers and tanker pilots. Uh, we had a lot of aircraft damage just sitting on the ground because they couldn't turn sideways and in that sort of wind they were just being pushed till they broke off wheels. Uh, wildland firefighters, um, Jamie and the guys were absolutely incredible. I mean, 36, uh, 48 hours going, going, going until eventually they crashed. Uh, the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, which was phenomenal helping us. Um, I think within the first 24 hours we had our EOCs set up. And once the state of emergency was declared, um, the emergency management teams took control of town and it was all outside of the elected officials' control. We lost one pilot, and this was three or four days after the Slave Lake fire, Jean-Luc Dubas and we're going through a big memorial planning for him. His family is over in France right now and uh, we're bringing them all in the Slave Lake. Uh, I have a couple uh, concluding remarks. And then I'll let Jamie actually talk a little bit more. In a few words, yes. Uh, to conclude, I mean, there's been a lot that's going, going on. We need more funding to keep this thing going. Uh, giving us $289 million won't even scratch what's going to go on in the next 10 years, never mind 20 years. Uh, we're looking at sprinkler systems, and Jamie will talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the integration with the fire department. The need for more research and development, because there's SOP manuals sitting on... Uh, in uh, bookcases all over the place. Slave Lake is so outside of the box, we're rewriting everything. We could not rely on, on standard practices anymore. Didn't fit. Right now, the Alberta government spends about $200 million in pre-suppression, putting air tanker contracts in place, training personnel, getting contract crews on the ground, setting up all the resources, equipment, supplies to get ready for fire season. Fire season now been moved up a month. Now my point is, this is pre-fire. What are we doing about post-fire? We spend a lot of, uh, of money getting things set up for our initial attack on fires once the fire starts. My, my question to all of you is what you can do to help us get ready for fire and mitigate any issues that we're going to have. Why spend $200 million to fight a fire when we could spend some millions uh, preventing it. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Jamie. I'm just looking at the timer here, watching Glenn freak out. So, the uh, I, I'm kind of thinking he's he's got it, and there's probably some questions. So, why don't we just start with that, Glenn, and that'll give us a couple extra minutes for that. Thanks. So I guess in a word, wow, right? Um, we only have time for a couple of questions, so anybody want to start it off? And... First, um, I just want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, I'm involved in disaster relief uh, work here for the province, and lots of lessons learned. My question is, you've done a lot of uh, fundraising, no, I shouldn't say fundraising, you've received a lot of uh, a do a donations and funds coming in. Um, I get about 14 or 15 million dollars. Do you have a disaster relief committee that's set up? What's the claims process? How are you getting that money out to those that need it? Uh, yes, I can answer that. We've, uh, because we didn't want to be a, a political group in charge of it, we've set up a citizen's uh, committee to take a look at those dollars and come up with a way of distributing dollars. Some of the donations come in earmarked for certain projects, uh, in the case of a library or in the case of uh, playgrounds or something like that. However, it's a, it's a small chunk of change compared to the overall amount of donations coming, coming in. 
during the next three months, that committee gets to decide on how to be fair and distribute those dollars. Um, with so many wildfires that have threatened Slave Lake in the past, um, and I keep hearing that Slave Lake wasn't uh, practicing fire smart principles, um, my question is, why wasn't it, and will you be in the future? <laughs> yeah, I'll answer it. Money. Same reason that lots of things don't get done. Um, fire smart costs money, millions of dollars. Um, in our province, they set aside $2 million a year to handle fire smart, and that doesn't divide by all those communities very well. So, um, are we practicing it now? Absolutely. We have $20 million put towards fire smart, so there's a lot of pressure on us. Uh, I, I would say that the world is watching what you do with $20 million to, to make a model fire smart community. So, we're working with the province and, and the local folks to try and make sure that we get. Uh, the right stuff done and to figure out what the right stuff is there's some people we work with here today partners in protection you know fire smart uh, it, it was a word we always used and we did what we could do maybe fifty thousand a year a hundred thousand a year whatever money we had um, but now we're spending 20 million so we're, we're doing the best job we can in the shortest amount of time possible but uh, it takes time to plan that out and decide what the best practices are and then to put them into place uh, for example our veg management is about eight million dollars so it takes a long time to cut down $8 million worth of trees um, in a swamp. <laughs> uh, I was, from an air attack perspective, I was never a believer in fire smart. Uh, once a target smokes in, I can't see what's going on and look at spotting. And I know I need a quarter to a half mile of open area to fight a fire. Uh, we're designed to fight that 90 percentile uh, violent fire. Slave Lake's been hit by those 95% things. I now believe in fire smart because anything that mitigates those, those lower energy fires gives me a chance. One more. Okay. Uh, before your presentation, we heard uh, some frustrations about those extra cars that were left on the driveways. Saw in, in some of your pictures and then we you showed the one picture of the evacuation row which was cars you know as far as I could see and I'm just wondering had everybody taken that second car off their driveway how that might have affected negatively the evacuation routes or, well, or is it not an issue it, it would have increased the amount of cars by uh, probably about 1200 just guessing off the fire reports so we would add another 1,200 units on the road, um, trying to get out of town and then on the highway. To, I don't think on the highway it would have been that big a deal, but in the in the areas we're talking about, um, in in the town, it, it would have been pretty rough to do it. And, and then you're splitting up families, which is the the psychological part of that. Um, there was people that were two cars, and then they got to some really dangerous areas and they abandoned one and got in together into one car. Uh, there's safety in numbers. There's safety with your family. I don't think people were thinking about their cars that much. They were thinking about getting out alive. Also. Yeah, well, it just seemed to me from looking at the picture that uh, efficient use of automobiles was was probably an important aspect of the evacuation. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there was there's so many people in the world that don't have a car. Um, our town, you know, it's 40 below in the winter usually, and uh, still there's hundreds of people that don't have a car. And they're just walking down the street, and people are picking them up and, and taking them to the city. And so it was... Uh, Vehicles were an interesting piece of the puzzle for sure. I, I think you're absolutely right on that question. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, there were a lot of cases of vehicles abandoned inside garages because as soon as the power went out, people with uh, electric garage doors didn't know how to open those doors and abandon their vehicles. Not realizing they could have just backed through the door and even gone. But this was the state that people were in. It was pure panic going on, yet Organized panic. Great. Thanks, guys.